All right, CNT 125, Chapter 8 on Segmentation. But in this chapter, we're going to look at different waves of segmentation, mainly subnets and VLANs, how subnetting works, how we calculate subnets, and also configuring VLANs. Now, there's a lot of concepts in Chapter 8 that we introduced in Chapter 3, so let's do a review of things we should remember from Chapter 3. That way we have that in our brain before we add um, the, the new information they're adding uh, for us in Chapter 8. So let's take a look. We should remember um, at the network layer we have IP addresses. These are assigned to every interface. Um, that way the nodes on the network have uh, unique IP addresses. Uh, can be used to find a computer in the world. There's actually a logic to it with the, uh, the different octets. These are mainly used for routing purposes. Routers use IP addresses to route traffic to the correct network. And we also have multiple names for them. Logical address, software address, layer 3, network layer address, etc. These are all names that we use kind of synonymously with IP address. There is two types, IP4 and IP6. Remember, IP4 is a 32-bit number written as four decimal numbers, you know, the 92.106.50.200. We also have IP version 6 addresses. These are written as 128 bits, um, and we typically use hexadecimal for abbreviating those 128 bits. So we end up with eight blocks of hex numbers, eight blocks of hex numbers. We should remember that on our network, there's two main addresses we work with, our logical and our physical. The logical being the IP address, network layer address, and the physical being the MAC address, the data link layer address. And we should remember the functions of these, the purposes of these. Uh, the IP addresses are used by devices like routers to get data to the correct network. As I use an example here, getting to the York campus of Hack versus the Gettysburg campus of Hack. Get it to the right network. The MAC address, the physical address, the MAC address, that's the one burnt into our NIC. This is the one that gets used to get the data to the correct PC at that destination network. In our example, you know, the York campus, if you will. Get it to the correct PC at the York campus as opposed to a PC at the Gettysburg campus. So as data is moving through a network, the IP address is getting used to route it through routers out there in the internet. Once it gets to, again, the York campus as opposed to the Gettysburg campus here, once it gets into the York campus, the router goes, I'm done, and we're really done with using the IP address. The switch will now use it, use the MAC address. The switch will now use the MAC address to get it to the correct computer here. So hopefully remember all that from... 120. We should hopefully remember that we can statically assign IP addresses. Um, we've already done that in our introduction lab. We actually statically set IP addresses and did some pings between them. This gets used for things like printers, servers, that kind of stuff in our network. So statically assigning IP addresses where we use the use the following and we literally plug an IP address in. Okay. We can also dynamically sign IP addresses. In this case, we set the device to say, hey, pick up your IP address from something, usually a DHCP server. And that DHCP server hands in an IP address to borrow for a while. So here, when I do obtain IP address automatically, we're doing a dynamic IP address setting. And something like a DHCP server is handing it an IP address to borrow for a while. Um, we have an APIPA address. Uh, a number, uh, this is a self-assigned number. If a computer is set for a dynamic, if we go back here, if we set it for a dynamic, and it tries to get an address from a DHCP server, and it can't for some reason, maybe the server's off, maybe there's a connection issue, what a PC will do is typically it will assign itself an IP address to use, and it'll be in a PIPA address, automatically privately assigned IP address. Um, that number range is the 169.254 number range. So if I see a 169.254, that usually indicates there's a problem. I'm set for dynamic and I can't get to a DHCP server or I'm not getting an address from a DHCP server. So that's usually a red flag for us. Uh, so remember your uh, automatically privately assigned IP address, a PIPA address. Remember here we can set our IP address. There's our IP address itself. With that, we also have the subnet mask. This lets us know what portion of the address is network, subnet, 
and host. We are going to spend a lot of time on that on Chapter 8. We're going to spend a lot of time on that here in Chapter 8. Um, this subnet mask lets us know what part of that address is network, what part is subnet, and what part is host. Default gateway, this is the address of typically, typically, the router we are attached to because the router can actually route my traffic outside of my network to another network. It'll actually look up in the routing table to go, where do I need to send this data? DNS, this is the address of a DNS server that can resolve names into IP addresses. This is an address of a server that ever can resolve names into IP addresses. So when I type in www.hack.edu, www.formula1.com, a DNS server can translate that name into an IP so we can actually route to that and get data from that entity. That's what your DNS is for. If I use the IP config command on my Windows PC, I will see those settings. If I use an ifconfig command on an Apple or Linux machine, I will see its settings as well. Subnet. Subnet is a smaller piece of a larger network, typically used to organize the network security, traffic control, etc., um, implemented by Network Admin. We're going to spend a lot of time on that later in this Chapter 8. It's a piece of a whole. So I might have a large network, and I might break it into smaller pieces. That's what's going on here. Um, and now I have smaller pieces that I can allocate to certain groups of my network. We are going to spend a bunch of time on that in Chapter 8. Just remember that we introduced that thought back in Chapter 3. The IP address in general, again, we have two of them, 32-bit IP4 address and a 128-bit IP6 address, IP version 6 address. Um, remember the two differences. The IP4, 32-bit number, we're going to spend a lot of time on this uh, in, in Chapter 8, and we're actually going to spend a little time on IP6 as well. We're going to implement IP4 networks, and we're also going to implement an IP6 network, so we are going to do both. IP4 32-bit address number, uh, typically written as a dotted decimal, three or excuse me, four decimal numbers. Each of those octets range from 0 to 255. Each of those numbers range from 0 to 255. So here would be a sample IP version 4 address. It really, as far as the computer is concerned, what the computer actually sees is we see the 192.168.1048, but what's really happening, the computer sees the binary version of that. That's what's really, that's what the computer really sees, and that's what's really getting transported across the network, those binary bits. So remember your binary conversions from back in 120. Um, again, if I do an IF config on Linux or Apple, I will see the IP address itself. If I do an IP config on Windows, I see the IP address itself. Remember, there are classes of IP version 4 addresses. This was from the days of early days of Internet. IANA organized the IP addressing scheme into classes and allocated IP addresses based on the type of network or type of organization you were. So if you were a class A, um, or excuse me, if you were a government of the world, you would have been allocated a class A. And what that meant was they dictated the first octet and the remaining three octets were for you, the network admin at that site, to assign to the hosts in your network. So the first octet was uh, given to you. The remaining three were like, use how you want. And with those three remaining octets, you had 24 bits to work with. So you could have 16,777,214 IP addresses for hosts on your network. This would be an example of your class A. There was your class A, and we knew it was a class A because the first octet started in the 1 to 126 range. Remember that range number. Remember that range number. Class B, this was set aside for large businesses. IANA would dictate the first two octets to you, and the remaining two were for you to use as you need it. So with those two remaining octets, they had um, 16 bits in there. 2 to the 16 allowed 65,534 addresses for hosts on your network. Um, so a, a class B, 185.96, and remember that first octet, uh, it would be in the range of 128 to 191. That way you would know it's a class B. Now remember, as we look at the first octet rules, 127 does not show up because 127 is set aside for loopback purposes. 127 is set aside for loopback purposes, so don't forget that as well. Class C, 
Class C was set aside for everybody else. Uh, what Iana did was uh, allocate the first three octets to you. The fourth octet was for you to use as you wanted. That gave you eight bits. Two of the eight would allow you 254 addresses for devices on your network, which, you know, in the early 80s was a lot. By today's standards is very few, considering the amount of devices that are hooked up in most networks. So your class C, the first octet was in the range of 192 to 223. Again, remember your first octet rule here to know A, B, and C. Class D was set aside for multicasting purposes. Um, there are routing protocols and things that use multicasting on a network. So we need to also remember unicast was a message sent to one and only one node. A broadcast is a message sent to everybody on the network. Um, kind of like, hey, I'm looking for the server, a DHCP server. Does anybody know where it is? And that would be a message going to everybody. Meanwhile, a multicast is a way to get a message to a group of people. Sometimes routing protocols will do that to just communicate among the routers. Sometimes things like a, a multimedia conference or a multimedia stream will use multicasting. Example, you know, three of us in a company subscribe to a uh, new product release from Block Company, Sony, Apple, you know, whoever, whatever it happens to be. So the three of us in that company are going to receive that data. Not one person, not everybody, just the three of us. So we would then belong to a multicast group that the routers and switches would know how to deal with. These are some reminders about Class A, the first uh, first octet is network. Class B, the first two octets are network. Class C, the first three octets are network. And again, that's kind of what we're seeing up here as well, different reminders of all of that. We should also remember that the subnet mask is a decoder letting us know what part of the address is network, what part is host. So as I look at this, here is our default subnet masks. Class A. The first octet was network, so 255-000. That 255 lets us know that octet is network. Class B, 255-255. That lets us know those first two networks, first two octets are network. Class C, 255-255-255 lets us know the first three octets are network. That's what that's doing for us. So a typical class A, here might be my typical class A IP address. Um, we're expecting the uh, uh, subnet mass to be network host host host. We're expecting to be 255000. That's the default. If we were to see another number here, we would know subnetting has occurred. And we'll get to that uh, later this chapter. Here's a typical class B, first two octets network, so default 255-255-00. If I see something here in the third octet, I know something has occurred, some subnetting has occurred. And class C as well. Class C is network, 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 host, so I'm expecting 255-255-255-0. If I see anything else out here in the last octet, I know subnetting has occurred. We cannot forget some special addresses. Um, zero in the uh, host portion would indicate the network number, kind of like just indicating the street, Main Street in Mechanicsburg, PA. And a all ones in the host portion, 255 in this case, is a message, is a way to send a broadcast to everybody on that street. Okay, we need to remember those. Zeros in the host portion is network, all ones or 255 in the host portion is a broadcast. Here's a couple of reminders on your loopback as well as your PIPA addressing. Okay, don't forget those. Don't forget those. And here's your loopback here that we had uh, mentioned back in 120. There's your PIPA that we had mentioned back in 120. Okay. We cannot forget about our private addresses. Uh, private addresses are set aside for use inside your network. I may use these inside my network, and I may translate them with a router to the public IP addresses outside. Very common. So don't forget your 10, your 172.16, and your 192.168. Don't forget those private addresses. Those get set aside for those purposes. All right, so hopefully all that kind of brought all that back to your memory for uh, from 120 before we dig into anything new with chapter 8.